Thank you very much. Um, Juliet, um, when Juliet Parker, when she asked me uh, if I kind of asked if I'd be on the panel, suggested that there were three things that I might uh, address. Uh, they were the state of accountability in the sector, progress made, and ongoing gaps. That was, that was just one of them. <coughs> um, how the research moves us forward, the limitations and remaining challenges, and uh, how and where the sector needs to move forward on this issue. So um, I will do my best around that. <laughs> uh, Mavis, Mavis kindly introduced me, but didn't uh, more kindly um, suggest that I haven't actually been in an operational position uh, in the fields, as it were, for, for a few years now. And so, so the, the experience that I have, personal experience that I have, is out of date. And I think, I think what is very interesting to me from here, from here at ALNAP, the ODI, um, thinking about the state of accountability in the sector, is perhaps how much has changed in such a short period of time. Um, there's a lot of it, there's a lot going on. And many of you, most of you, are involved in that. Uh, so you know as well as me that there, there's... You know, if you look at um, HPN's issue 52 last year, which was, was looked at a variety of different accountability mechanisms, there were a lot of things being done by NGOs and UN. Um, if you look at the transformative agenda that Andy mentioned, um, and all the related ISC activities around accountability, um, the donor interest, the work uh, that's happening with DFID, um, looking at, at, at accountability mechanisms, our own research at ALNAP, uh, with CDA, where we're looking at feedback mechanisms, is throwing up many, many examples of great practice. Um, and a lot of that is driven by the ingenuity and the desire of people on the ground to do this right. And a lot of this, I think, is probably also driven by the fact the world is changing. Technology opens up the possibility to do things more easily um, that perhaps weren't doable before, using mobile phones and, and Facebook and all kinds of things. Um, and maybe the, maybe the changing world, um, the location of disasters moving to, in some cases, more urban areas, more middle-income areas, and general social changes in the world mean that the sort of people that we're working with on the ground expect more. They have legitimate expectations um, to be given information and to have their <coughs> views taken into account in a way that was perhaps not the case 15 years ago. And, if that is the case, then that's a, that's a good thing for the way the world is going in general, and it also makes it incumbent on us to do more. Um, and when one looks around, maybe, maybe it's true that there's more going on in terms of accountability in the sort of monitoring, feedback, ongoing programmatic area than there is at the, in the needs assessment area or in the evaluation area. Um, and that might be perhaps a function of just the fact that that's where the ongoing relationship exists. You know, these are, these are processes rather than moments in time, whereas needs assessment is still very much often seen as a moment in time, and so is evaluation. One thing that I think is very interesting, not because it's specifically about accountability, but, but in the needs assessment, is the challenge and the struggle that people like Mira um, and ACAPS are having trying to move an agenda of needs assessment which is moving from needs assessment into a place where it's more about context assessment and capacity assessment and perhaps part of that struggle you know instead of is the struggle about recalibrating the way we think about the relationships that we have with people um, the way a needs assessment is very much about you know a, a fairly passive model of beneficiaries who are in a place of receiving um, a context assessment is about a model where we are one actor among many. Um, and maybe that change is, whilst that's, that specific example is not about accountability, maybe that speaks to some of the changes that are required in, if you like, our, our group understanding of the job we're doing uh, to make accountability take root. So um, how does this research move us forward? Well, I think... There are many things I would like to say about this research um, because I think it's, it's, it's really inspiring in many ways, but I'll only say one. Um, and that is that I think it moves us forward because it takes this issue seriously enough. Um, it, does, it takes it seriously enough to really investigate it and to interrogate it and to open it up to challenge. Um, it's easy to say, well, this is a, a moral, and it's, of course, completely correct 
to say this is a moral imperative. It is that we do it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. But if we don't need evidence that something is the right thing to do, yeah. but to go the next stage, to do the thing right, we need evidence. And I think that's where this, this is a very groundbreaking piece of work in many ways, because it steps beyond the kind of statement of, well, we do this because it's a good thing to do and we don't need it, to actually interrogate it. Because there was always the possibility that Andy and the team would, of course, find that it doesn't make a difference. You know? And that was, that was the challenge about the thing, was kind of we're opening ourselves up to that conversation, and then what would we do? How does the sector need to move forward? Um, well, you know better than I. Here, here are some ideas. Um, I think drawing on the report itself, uh, there's a challenge to keep the focus on this. You know, having made this first step, I think, as, as Andy was suggesting, it would be very good if we opened the doors of inquiry wider and we're prepared to challenge some of our preconceptions and put them to the test. Um, and I think it's important that we, sometimes the things that are most productive can also be double-edged swords. And I think one of the things that's very important about this piece of research is that it's attempted to be robust and evidential in such a way that the evidence is based around the experience and understanding of the people on the ground. Yeah? And so one thing we need to think about going forward as we go forward with hopefully a more evidence-based approach to the humanitarian endeavor is thinking how that evidence-based approach can incorporate the understanding of the world and the opinions of the world, um, which people from different cultural and social backgrounds to our own hold, and not reducing everything down to numbers. There is a place for numbers, but I think what this has done is shown that we need to continue with the research, and that research needs to take into account people's views. Um, I think another challenge, and, and it really came out in, in what Andy was saying there, and I use this as a challenge, not, you know, not as a, a problem, but it's just something that we need to think about, is, is ensuring that the focus of accountability work is on the results of accountability and not the mechanisms which provide accountability. The, the mechanisms are a tool to do the job. Um, but, but really, they're a tool that gets used because of the values of the individuals and of the organizations and the beliefs of those individuals and organizations and the desire of those people to create relationships of a certain kind. And the accountability is embedded within that relationship, not within the fact that you're using a text message or a paper tool or whatever. And I think that's probably quite important because it's also more difficult to do. Um, and of course, the, another part of that is that that then makes it incumbent to actually use the information as opposed to just collecting the information. So part of this change is about, as, as Andy said, you know, is, is about how does the information actually get used? And I know this is something that the work of uh, the ALNAP member CDA, who've done a lot of work, as you know, around this, something they're very concerned about is so we're collecting a lot of information, but are we using it? Um, I think this third set of challenges, and in some ways, you know, the ones that we might find the most difficult are, are those around the limits of accountability. And I'm on quite thin ice here um, because we've spent so long talking about the importance of accountability because there wasn't very much of it ar around. The more we go into this area, I, I think we will see that doing accountable programming is difficult and it brings out challenges of its own. Um, Firstly, the model of humanitarianism is not, it is a wholesale model. It is not a boutique model. You know, it's not a, it's not a model which is well designed or well adapted to providing <coughs> highly contextualized, highly individual or community based responses as the whole thing as it currently exists, I would suggest, doesn't necessarily work very well that way. So it's a fairly thoroughgoing change that we would be talking about if we were to remodel humanitarianism to do that. Second, the second limit, uh, potential limit, is 
And it's something that I don't think Ali brought up, but I think what was one of the most imp interesting pe pieces for me in the, the report is the report talks about people having a different understanding of what accountability is from the understanding that we had taken with us. Yeah. And more broadly, a, a challenge will come at some point, uh, does, I mean, on the ground every day, um, when, when we hear what people want and when we hear that the things that they want do not accord with humanitarian principles or with our own deeply held values or with the values of the taxpayers who gave us the money to hold in trust or the individuals who gave us the money to hold in trust for those people, how are we going to deal with that? You know, what, where do we go with that? Um, and we see this already very often, but it's may, I, I'm not aware that these examples have necessarily been brought together. Um, but someone might, I'd, I'd be very happy if someone did know, because I'd like to, like to see it. And the third thing is accountability. The third limit, or the third challenge I think we might face is accountability to whom? Um, communities, the communities that we work in, certainly the communities I've worked in, certainly all the communities I've lived in, are not homogenous entities, they're political entities. Um, so, if we are being accountable to, is it the chief, is it the is it the, the 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 priest, the imam, is it the Taliban, is it the women, is it the scheduled caste or the people who are normally marginalised? Whose voice counts? You know, when we start doing it properly, we start realising I think that that's a very real problem, because it asks us in the end or at least makes us face up to the fact that as international humanitarians, we've gone into someone else's world. And what was our intent in doing that? Was our intent to put things back the way they were the day before? Or was our intent to change things so that they end up being different? If we're building back better, that's not just about houses. Are we also talking about being catalysts for social change? Um, now, to the degree that we talk about accountability in fairly kind of generic ways and talk about it as a good thing, we don't really have to face up to those problems. When we start doing the work um, that our colleagues here have started to do, um, those problems start coming up the road pretty quickly. And with them, hopefully, the same sort of thoughtful <coughs> um, and innovative solutions that our sector is so good at. <coughs>